And as you can see, we're in Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through verses 32. Now this morning, we begin the final phase of Jesus' earthly ministry. And that, of course, culminates in the crucifixion and the subsequent resurrection. Now, I want you to remember from the previous studies in Mark, in previous lessons, that we've come along a similar theme that comes up again and again. And that theme is Jesus Christ does everything for us. He goes to Gethsemane and suffers there for us. He goes before a trial and is mocked and ridiculed before both Jews and Gentiles. He does that for us. And now this morning, we're going to see Jesus take upon himself the most excruciating form of death, death on a cross, and he does that for us. Now, next week, I'm going to be focusing on the atonement and how it satisfies God's justice and wrath. But this morning, in Jesus' death on the cross, we're going to be focusing on the removal of our sins. You're going to see Jesus, the blameless, sinless one, become a curse for us. We're going to see Jesus remove our sins as far away as the east is from the west. And you're even going to see this morning that Jesus, in his most dire hour, parched of thirst in the Mideast sun, doesn't even receive wine because he came to take it all and he did it for us. And so, dear ones, this morning, this isn't about what you are to do other than to believe. This morning's message is about reveling in what Christ has done for you. As Bob said so well, so many times, you can know that your sins are forgiven through faith in him and that you have eternal life. That's what the cross is all about. Now, let's begin in verse 21, where it really sets the stage here as Simon of Cyrene is going to bear Christ's cross. We begin, it says, they. Now, remember that they would have been the Roman soldiers. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now, remember, normally a condemned man in Roman law would have to bear his own cross. He would bear his own transverse beam. But recall what Jesus has been through over the last 15 hours. He's been mocked. He's been ridiculed. He's gone through the stress of a trial. He's been scourged, which most men did not survive. And so Jesus, dehydrated, simply can't hold up under the cross. And so the Romans have to do something that they have the right to do. They had the right to requisite people to carry out tasks. Now, this right under Roman law was called impressment. So notice here on the screen, if I can get my cursor there, when it says they pressed into service, that originally was a Persian concept. When the Persians were the dominant military power in the world, what they would do is instead of using their combat troops for carrying the mail, for example, they would press into service civilians to do that. And so the Romans learned from that, and they pressed civilians into doing all sorts of things. And so here they press Simon of Cyrene to bury this heavy crossbeam. Now, who is Simon of Cyrene? Well, Cyrene was a North African city, probably filled with diaspora Jews. And so more than likely, Simon is a god fear. But I think there may be a, a chance that he ends up becoming a believer because Mark not only mentions him, but he also mentions the children. And the apostle Paul seems to make reference to one of the children at the end of his epistle in Romans. Romans 16, 13, Paul says, Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Now, this raises, I think, an important question. I've been asked before by people, sometimes they're not believers, they'll say, who was present during the crucifixion of Christ if all of the disciples had indeed abandoned Jesus? Well, we know that not all of the disciples did abandon Christ. We know John, according to John chapter 19, would have been at the foot of the cross. Remember, Jesus says to him, behold your mother, and he gives his mother into her, or into his care, rather. So we know that he was certainly there. But Simon of Cyrene, if he was a believer, he would have been a witness. And certainly the women would have been a very important witness to the details surrounding the crucifixion. So there were plenty 
of eyewitnesses to these events. Now, in verses 22 through 23, we see Jesus takes all of God's punishment. It says, Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So Jesus here is brought to the place called Golgotha. In Latin, it's translated Calvary. So that's why we see that term all over. In fact, it's really Calvary locus. Locus is place, Calvary is skull. It's the place of the skull. And the reason it's called place of the skull, I think, more than likely, isn't simply because the hill looks like a skull, but more than likely it's called that because the inhabitants of Jerusalem knew exactly what would transpire there. That was the place that the Romans did their dirty work when they would put people to death. I think that's why it's called that. Now, notice in verse 23, it says, They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh. Now, there's two different interpretations of this. Traditionally, most scholars have held out that the they who gave the wine and the myrrh to Jesus were the women of Jerusalem. And the reason these women of Jerusalem would have done this is because the Talmud called them to. The Babylonian Talmud borrowed from Proverbs 31, verses 6 through 7. Listen to what it says. Proverbs 31, 6 through 7, it says, Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Now, the only problem with the women being the ones who give Jesus wine is notice, again on the screen, the context. Whoever the they is that are giving Jesus wine, it's the same they that brought him to the place of Golgotha. So more than likely in context, and both Matthew and Mark support this, it was the soldiers. The soldiers were the ones who gave Jesus the wine. Now, from this, I think some scholars have wrongly concluded that the soldiers didn't care about Jesus, and therefore they wouldn't give him anything to deaden his pain. That's not the point. The soldiers simply follow orders. And I think if you look at the Reconstruction, they had a procedure. The procedure is you go to crucify a man, you give him his allotment of wine mixed with myrrh. The great scholar in the book of Mark, William Lane, he says, whether or not myrrh actually deadens pain, the ancients believed it did. There was a first century medical source where myrrh was thought to have deadened pain. And so I think the soldiers give it to Jesus. It's wine, and it is dehydration. That would give him a little bit of a sedative effect alone. But then they also have it laced with myrrh. And that was the procedure of the Roman soldiers. But Jesus refuses, and the question is why? In his most dire hour in this thirst, can you imagine what that would feel like? But yet he takes even that and he spits it out. And I think there's two reasons. And I don't think the reasons are mutually exclusive. I think it's both and. Number one, Jesus came to take it all. Way back in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, remember in Mark 14, 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. If it be possible... Take this cup, that's the cup of wrath, from me. But nonetheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so there we saw Jesus was our new Adam. The first Adam went into a garden of perfection, and he said, not your will, Lord, but mine. Jesus goes in to the garden of the oil press, where he's pressed out. And he says, not my will, but thine. Jesus came to take it all. Take the full measure of God's wrath upon himself. Now, there's another reason. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. Remember, back when Jesus institutes his Lord's Supper, he takes of the third cup. That's the cup of redemption. And he says, and we're going to be celebrating this today. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins in my blood. That's how it's worded in Matthew 26. Now, why is that significant? Well, right after he says that, he does not partake in the fourth cup, the cup of consummation. Instead, he says, Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. Isn't it true that later on the cross, these Roman soldiers offer up 
sour wine? And Jesus partakes of that. Isn't that fruit of the vine? I would say no, and here's why. The sour wine, oxos, is literally a, a vinegar water mix. A vinegar water that really was used like a smelling salt for the soldiers who had to work long hours. And the only reason there was a little wine in it was so that the alcohol would keep that mixture from going bad in the midi sun. But here, the term is oinas. And the Roman soldiers really are giving Jesus the fruit of the vine. And he rejects it because he's the promise keeper. He takes it all and he remembers it all, all for us. Verses 24 through 25 says, And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. Now, notice what's highlighted in red. This is a direct citation from Psalm 22:18. Now, realize Psalm 22 forms the backdrop of the narrative while Jesus is on the cross. And I think just as Psalm 16:10. Remember Psalm 16:10. Everybody, put your noodles together. Remember Psalm 16:10. The Holy One would not see decay. Remember Peter's point at the sermon at Pentecost was that Psalm 1610 wasn't about David, but David knew that it was about the Christ. I think the same thing can be said of Psalm 22 because it really lays out really the life of Christ and his sufferings. And so I think that that's what's going on. Psalm 2218, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, did that ever literally happen of David? No. But he, as an anointed one of God, probably felt very similar things. But it literally is fulfilled in Christ. Here, Jesus, the creator of all things, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, leaves this world with not even the shirt on his back. That's what this fallen world thinks of him. They took it all, and Jesus gave it all, and he does it for us. Now, notice here in verse 24, In verse 25, you have it accentuated the idea that he was crucified. And you have to realize that crucifixion is the most horrendous way that a man could die. In fact, the ancients would say that a man who suffered crucifixion had died a thousand deaths. But as I say that, I'm not going to focus on all of the gory details. I think that evangelicalism has gotten too much involved with all of the gory details. Notice the gospel writers don't do that. What is significant in Christ's crucifixion is not the gory details, but what he accomplishes for the people. And that's what the gospel writers focus on. Now, why was the crucifixion necessary? Well, number one, crucifixion was necessary because the Old Testament in three different places had predicted the necessity of the Messiah being pierced. Now, where do we see those texts? Well, first of all, we see it again in Psalm 22, 16. David writing 970 years in advance says that they had pierced his hands and his feet. Now, again, he may have felt as if the enemies of God were doing that to him, but they're literally fulfilled in Christ. And so think of Psalm 22, 16 as predicting the fact that the future son of David, the anointed one, would have his hands and his feet being pierced. Now, skip ahead about 250 years, and you come to the time of Isaiah. Now, in Isaiah's day, he explains why the Messiah, the suffering servant, has to be pierced. He says in Isaiah 53, 5, that the Messiah would be pierced through for our transgressions. So now we've gone from the Messiah will be pierced to now why is he pierced? Well, it's for our transgressions. Now skip ahead another 250 years. You come to Zechariah 12.10 and Yahweh cries out there. He says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And so the Jews couldn't understand this passage. They wrestled with it. Why? Because how can God, who is spirit, be pierced? And of course, he cannot. 
And so they took the Hebrew term pierced, daker, and they said it's a metaphor. But what they didn't understand is this begged the question, who is this one that is pierced? It's the God-man. God who becomes man, that's who the Messiah will be. Psalm 22, Messiah will be pierced. Isaiah 53, 5, why is he pierced? Zechariah 12, 10, who is this one that is pierced? He's the God-man. It was necessary, this crucifixion. It was necessary that the Messiah be pierced for the transgressions of the people. That's the significance of crucifixion. Now, it's also absolutely essential, this crucifixion, because as it says in Deuteronomy 21, 23, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And whether we like it or not, the Jews would have seen that cross, that wood, as the tree. And so it was necessary, this crucifixion, that Jesus would become a curse for us, that he'd be pierced through for us. That's the significance of the crucifixion, not all of the gory details. And again, we'll talk more about this in our application. Now, we see now Jesus' enemies mock him on the cross. Remember, last time we focused last week on the mockery of Christ, well, that continues. And it continues on the cross here in verses 26 through 30. It says, The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Now notice the inscription that would have been above Jesus on the vertical beam, the king of the Jews. And I want you to, again to think about the irony here. Jesus is being condemned for who he truly is. He is king of the Jews. He's king of the Gentiles. In fact, he's the king of the whole world. And one day, when he returns in power and in glory, he will, be the, he will be the one who condemns those who don't trust in him. But for now, he's being condemned for who he truly is. And they don't stop there. They mock him further. Notice in verse 29, they wag their heads at him as they hurl insults and abuse against him. Now, this wagging of the head again is a reference back to Psalm 22. Let me read it to you, and you'll see how apropos it is for Jesus. Psalm 22, 7 through 8. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to Yahweh. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. And so I'm sure in David's day, yes, he was mocked because he was God's anointed. And then what we see throughout history is we go to Isaiah 37. Sennacherib is one who wags his head and mocks the people of God. In fact, God wipes them out because of it. And then in Jeremiah 18, the Babylonians wag their head at the people of God. But you know, the people of Judah and the people of Israel, the way they were acting, they deserved it. But here is the sinless one the true son, the faithful son, and humanity that he created wags their head at him. And you and I, again, have to know that it's only temporary. And notice what they mock him with. They say, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. I remember many years ago when Bob was preaching, I think it was back in 2006, I remember him making the point that Jesus was the only one ever in history who had predicted his resurrection on the third day, and then pulled it off. And the more time that has gone by in my life, I see that as more and more significant. Why? Notice here, on the screen before you in the red, these were the enemies of Christ. The enemies of Christ are acknowledging that Jesus predicted his resurrection on the third day. Unwittingly, they're corroborating what the Bible says. Jesus predicted his resurrection on the third day, and he pulled it off. The tomb was empty, and no one knew where he went except those who saw him raised from the dead. Dear ones, it's a very powerful apologetic. Remember that. Tell people when you're witnessing to them. Even the enemies of Christ knew that he had predicted his own resurrection on the third day. 
It's not something that was concocted by Christians. It was stated by unbelievers. Now we see in verses 31 through 32 that what is it that keeps Christ on the cross? It's his love. It says, in the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. Now, dear ones, think about for just a moment this idea of corporate solidarity. What I mean by that is, in the ancient Near East, they had the idea that the leadership was responsible for the people, and the people were responsible for the leadership. And so if the leadership spoke, it really represented the nation as a whole. And so here, as the religious leaders of Israel speak, they're representing the voice of Israel. And so I would submit to you that what I have highlighted in red in verse 32 is really the summary of the Gospel of Mark. It's what it's about. You have the leadership of Israel knowing Jesus' claim, and listen to what they say. Let this Christ, that's Messiah, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. That's what it's all about. Why is Jesus put to death? Because of his claim to be the Messiah. The leadership, all of Israel knew it. Here they're rejecting it. That is, it's the majority report. Now, a couple of points that I think are significant here. Think about it. It's precisely because Jesus is the Christ, precisely because he is the king of Israel, the Jews, that he has to be on the cross. Isn't that what Isaiah 53, 5 said? That he'd be pierced through for our transgressions? Of course it is. That's precisely why he's on the cross, because he is the Messiah. Point number two, even if Christ had come down, they wouldn't believe. Why? Remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. The rich man is an unbeliever, and he's in Hades. And in torment, he wants to warn his brothers so they don't come there, that they would believe. So he wants Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead, and his reasoning is, certainly, if my brother saw someone come back from the dead, they'd believe. And Abraham says to him, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, that's the scriptures, neither will they believe if someone came back from the dead. Brothers and sisters, even if Jesus came down, they wouldn't believe. You see, we have to understand that belief in the gospel is a supernatural act. And so this has been foreordained by God, this partial hardening of the people of Israel. Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me. Now again, it's not permission. He's talking about ability. No one has the ability to come to him unless the Father draws him. And so we have to realize that no, even if he came down, they wouldn't believe. Belief is a supernatural work that God gives. Now the good news is one day they will believe. Brothers and sisters, the crucifixion of the Messiah was predicted in the Old Testament for the removal of sin. And now, those who are responsible, the very leadership of Israel that should be leading people to messianic salvation, now they impugn Jesus for carrying out his messianic obligations. They're impugning him for doing what the scriptures called him to do. That's what's happening. And so Christ, yes, he could have come down, but what kept him there was the love of his people, the love of those who would trust in him. And this is why Paul stated in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what kept him on the cross, the love for his beloved people. Think of this analogy. There's an old story where there's a man who had an eight-year-old daughter, and they're driving in the car, it's a warm summer day, and his eight-year-old daughter is deathly allergic to bee stings. She's been stung once before, and she almost dies from her throat closing. And so they're driving along, nice summer day, the windows are down, and all of a sudden he hears, Daddy, Daddy, there's a bee in the car, there's a bee in the car, and the panic sets in on him. 
because he knows if that bee stings his little, little girl, she could die. And so the man cannot pull the car over fast enough. He gets it pulled over the side of the road. He dives in the back seat. He finds the bee, and he slams his hand over it, and he waits, and he waits, and finally, bzz, he takes it. Oh, it hurts bad. But he removed the possible sting for the one that he loved. You see, the bee can only sting once. And that's what Jesus did for his people on the cross. He took once and for all the sting of death, sin, and hell for us. That's what kept him on the cross, brothers and sisters. That's what you and I are to understand here today from this passage. Now, let's turn to some applications. I have three of them for you this morning. Number one, we must know that Jesus' crucifixion was necessary so that he could be a curse for us. But again, that's why he had to be hung on a tree, as it were. Second, we should know that Jesus' death outside the gate symbolizes the removal of our sins. And we'll talk about that. Number three, we can remember today that Jesus forsook taking wine to keep his promises that he made to us. Now, let's begin with number one, that Jesus was a curse for us. Think about it. He's hung on a tree for all intents and purposes. But here's what you have to realize. The people of Israel were never commanded by God to hang anyone on a tree. Their preferred means of killing the enemy, that is someone who had defied God, was stoning. So God commanded that they would stone those who had rebelled against God. But God fundamentally understood that in the culture of the day, what people would often do is they would hang someone on a tree so that the rest of the society would in, indeed be in fear of doing the same thing. And so I want you to understand that God doesn't command the hanging of a tree, but he knows that the Israelites will do that. And so I want you to turn your Bibles, if you will, to Deuteronomy 21, verses 20 through 21. I want to show you this concept of being hung on a tree. Turn your Bibles again to Deuteronomy 21, verses 20 through 21. Now, in the context, as you're turning your Bibles to Deuteronomy 21, verses 20 through 21, the context is you have a rebellious youth. They're rebelling against their parents, and therefore they're rebelling against God. They're defying him. And so listen to what's prescribed. Deuteronomy 21, verse 20, it says they, that would be the parents, shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from your midst. And all Israel will hear of it and fear. Now, just a quick aside, this is a passage that Bob had referenced some time ago in Sunday school. And I want you all to think about, if you want to go back to the Mosaic Law, this is part of the moral law. And so we're very blessed to be under the new covenant, aren't we? Now, let's continue on then. Notice then what's connected is verses 22 through 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and the son, the rebellious son, would be an example, and he is put to death, and you, notice God doesn't command this, he just says, when you do this, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him, on the same day, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. So no, notice here, they are to kill by stoning. But God assumes that they're going to take that body and they're going to put it on a tree so it cannot remain up overnight. Why? Because it symbolizes the curse of God. Notice what the text says, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. So someone is not accursed because they're hanging on a tree. Listen carefully. They're hanging on a tree because they're accursed of God. Because if you defy God and you're in rebellion against God, you'll be hung on a tree and therefore you're cursed of God. And so, for example, when we get to Joshua chapter 8, Joshua is responsible for bringing the people into the conquest of Canaan. And they come across a Canaanite stronghold that is also defying God. 
And so listen to the ones who defy God. What happens to them? Joshua 8, 23, it says, but they took alive the king of Ai. Remember, they're to kill him and brought him to Joshua. Now, verse 29, Joshua does what's right. It says, he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset, Joshua gave command, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the city gate. So Joshua is heeding here Deuteronomy 21. He doesn't allow the cursed man of Ai, this king, to be up overnight. Why is the king of Ai cursed? Because he defied God. He rebelled against God. Why would you have a teenager stoned in Israel if they defied God? And so now when we come to the New Testament, we have a substitution in Jesus Christ who never defied God. He only honored God. He only obeyed God. And yet he's hung on a tree. That's how he can be a sacrifice. He's a curse for us. And this is Paul's grand point then in Galatians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Paul says, however, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, now here comes Leviticus 18.5. He who practices them shall live by them. Now let me stop there. What is happening in Leviticus 18.5 is God is giving the hypothetical offer is that if the Israelites can differentiate themselves from the Canaanites and therefore obey his commands, they shall have eternal life. That's what Paul infers in this passage. What's the problem with that? No one can obey. James 2.10, in fact, we see it two verses earlier. The implication is no one can obey and do all things in the law, and therefore a man is justified by faith, Habakkuk. Chapter 2. But think about James 2.10. James 2.10. James says, if a man kept the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, he's broken the whole thing. And so no one can do that. This hypothetical is one that's never filled out except for Christ. And so that's where the good news comes in then in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why were you hung on a tree if you defied God? Did Jesus ever defy God? No. Therefore, he's our substitute. You see, because he never defied God, and therefore he doesn't deserve the wrath of God, he can take our place. He can have it in our stead. And that is the core of the gospel. That's what differentiates Christianity from all other false religions on the planet. Not only that we have a substitute, but we have a worthy substitute. A substitute that is capable of becoming a curse for us. And this is exactly what Jesus had prophesied. One of the most important passages in all of the gospels. Jesus had prophesied in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man, that's his favorite self-designation, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let me point to the screen. Notice the idea of substitution. Huper, for, anti, for, both are synonymous. It's the idea on behalf of, having become a curse on behalf of us, to give his life on behalf of the many. That's the idea that's being conveyed. He is a substitute and we need them. The bad news revealed in the scriptures is that every single one of us in here, every person that's ever been born, save Christ through the virgin birth, has defied God and therefore is cursed. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Perhaps there are some listening and they say, well, I don't really believe that. Well, then you're at rebellion against God. That's further sin. God himself has declared that every man, every woman, every child is born a sinner. And the wages of this sin is death, and he's not blowing smoke. It's not just temporary death. It's eternal death in the lake of fire. And if anyone wants to deny that, take the issue up with Yahweh. He stated it. It's in his word. That's very serious. And that's why it's such a serious remedy, that God becomes man for us. Jesus, through a virgin birth, becomes a man so that he can represent us. The new Adam, who lives a perfect life, who never defies God, 
and therefore on the cross, he can become a curse for us. So he can remove our sins. That's what Jesus did. And the proof that he did it was the fact that he was raised on the third day. His resurrection proves his claims. And then he ascends on high. He's seated at the right hand of the God where he lives to make intercession for us. What must we do? Well, this Jesus commands us to repent and to believe the gospel. Repentance has to do with the turning from all false religions and all false gods and idolatry and turning to God, the true God, turning to him on his terms, which is faith alone in Jesus alone and all of that by his grace alone. That's what we must do to be saved. Believe upon the one who became a curse for you who had lived a life that never defined God. Now let's go to number two. Jesus goes outside the gates for us. What I'm going to focus again on is this idea of expiation, that God removes sin. Now the core of expiation is this idea that man's sins are removed. And so as we saw Jesus go to Golgotha, recall that Golgotha is outside the gates. Golgotha, according to Archaeology is right where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre would be, more than likely. And most archaeologists would agree that that was outside the second wall. Now, why is that important? Well, because it means that Jesus, therefore, suffered outside the gates. And we have biblical corroboration that this occurred according to Hebrews 13, 12. That Jesus suffered outside the gates. Now, why is that important? Because it's borrowing right from the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. And I want to show you that here in just a moment. Leviticus 16. Turn your Bibles, in fact, Leviticus 16.21. Leviticus 16.21. As you're turning there, let me set the stage for the Day of Atonement. This happened only once a year in the Hebrew calendar. There's three animals that you got to get your hands around to understand the Day of Atonement. There was two goats. Of the two goats, one will be led away. The symbolism is the removal of the people's sin. One goat is going to be slain, and its blood will go inside the Holy of Holies, and it will appease the wrath of God for the sins of the people. There was also a bull, and that was sacrificed, and its blood was slain, and it was poured on the altar as well, and that was to appease the wrath of God for the sins of the priests. Now, what you have to realize is that even the animals, that bull and the goat, that are slain and the blood is poured on the mercy seat, those animals are burned outside the city. So the scapegoat goes outside the city. Those two other animals are burned outside the city. Normally, the priest could have a share in the food that came from the animal. Not on the Day of Atonement. Everything is outside the city gate. It's the symbolism of the removal of the sins of the people. So now we're going to focus on the scapegoat. Listen to what the Lord said here to Aaron. Remember, he was the high priest, and therefore he represents Israel. Leviticus 16, 7 through 10. The Lord says to Aaron, He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now, let me just stop there. The term scapegoat, if any of you have an ESV version, it will say Azazel. And the reason they do that is there's been three primary interpretations of who this scapegoat or Azazel was. Azazel is literal from the Hebrew. And the majority of scholars today believe it was a reference to a demon. A demon that would be living out in the wilderness. And so the idea then was that the goat was cursed. And so that, that fits well. But one of the problems that we run into is now you have this idea that this demon gets his atonement and God gets his. And so I favor the traditional reading. I think it's better. It comes from the Septuagint, and that is scapegoat. There's a simple etymology, as is goat, and azel would be away. It's an away goat. It's a scapegoat. And I think the context favors that. That it's the idea of removal is what's on, what's in play here. And so I think the scapegoat from the NASB is the best rendering here. Now, let's continue on. Then what happens to this scapegoat? In verse 9, it says, Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell 
and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Now, do you have your Bibles turned to Leviticus 16.21? Everybody look there. The narrative continues. There's more detail now about what to do with this scapegoat. Notice in verse 21, it says, Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands. Now remember, who is Aaron? He's the high priest of Israel. Who is he representing? All of the people. So he's to lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat. So now the goat is vicariously taking the sins of the people. And where is it to go? It's to send it away into the wilderness by the hand of the man who stands in readiness. And so the goat would go out into the wilderness outside the gates as a symbol that the sin of the people has been removed. And so Jesus, when he's crucified, he goes to Golgotha outside the gates because in him the sins of the people have been removed. Just as David had prophesied in Psalm 103, 12, as far away as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, this means a lot to me more and more I live. I don't know how many in here perhaps have a difficult time with receiving forgiveness. You say, you know, I repented of some sin, but it keeps coming up over and over in my mind, and I don't know if God can really Forgive me for that. And what this text says to you today, because Christ removed your sins as far away as the east is from the west, what that means is that the moment you confessed, God took your sin and drowned it in the sea of forgetfulness. And so when you go before him, he literally says, what sin? What sin? It's been removed is far away as the east is from the west. By the way, what's interesting to me about the east from the west, you know, you can go east forever. I'm a pilot, I know this. I've never tried it, but you can keep flying east. And you'll keep going east and east and east, and you can go west and west and west, but you can only go north so long before you come south again. And isn't it interesting the creator didn't say, hey, your sins are as far away as the north is from the south. That's not eternal, but east from the west is. Your sins have been removed forever. That's what you have to know. That's what Bob was saying. My sins are forgiven. And when you are ready to breathe your last, that's what matters, is that your sins have been removed forever and that you have eternal life. That's what Jesus did for you on the cross. He removed them far away. He expiated our sins. Now, the last point I want to drive home with you here this morning is that Jesus even refused wine for us. Let's remind ourselves of what he did at the Lord's Supper. Remember, there were four cups that were part of the Passover. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. The second cup was the cup of deliverance. The third cup was the cup of redemption. The fourth cup was the cup of consummation. And all those cups reminded the Israelites of the promises that God had from Exodus chapter 6. And so as Jesus is instituting his supper, he stops at the third cup, and that's what we're going to be celebrating today. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. And then he goes on to say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And the implication then is, of course, the next time he drinks of the fruit of the vine, it will be with him in the kingdom of God. And so now he's on the way to the cross, and it doesn't get any worse than this. He's thirsty. He's been bleeding for hours. Most men died from the scourging, and so he's completely dehydrated, and he could use just a little bit to wet the whistle. And so it says in verse 23, they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Why? Because he came to take it all, the full measure of God's wrath, and he came to keep his promise. Brothers and sisters, he does everything for us. Jesus is arrested for us. He's mocked for us. He's ridiculed for us. And now he's crucified for us. And could he have just a little bit 
of wine just to wet the whistle in his darkest hour? No, because he comes to take it all. He comes to remember the promise that he made. That the next time he drinks of it will be with us. And we see this prophesied earlier in the Bible in Isaiah 25. This section, by the way, is sometimes called the little apocalypse. And this is a foreshadowing of the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the next time Jesus drinks of the fruit of the vine, it's with us. All those who would trust in him in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that was being prophesied here in Isaiah 25. Notice what it says. Verses 6 through 8, it says, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on his mountain, a banquet of aged wine. There's fruit of the vine. And it says, Choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain... He will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched out over all the nations. Let me stop there for a moment. What is this business? I can find my cursor. There it is. What is this business about a covering being over the people and a veil being over all the nations? Well, I think in context, that covering is obviously death. Death is a part of every man's experience, every woman. And notice here the great promise is that one day God is going to swallow it up. Bala. And that's significant. Why? Because in the culture of the day, Isaiah and the people of God are surrounded by false gods with a small g. Pagan deities, and all they would do is they would have a cycle of life and death. Life and death. You have the springtime, you have life, you have winter, you have death. And so just like the Eastern religions today, that are becoming so popular with the American people, all the Eastern religions and their gods can offer is a continuous cycle of life and death, life and death. But the great God of the Bible, through Jesus Christ, is promising that he's going to swallow it up. And so all the people of God will have who have trusted in Jesus is they'll only have life. Why? Because death is swallowed up. That we serve. How much better and greater is Jesus Christ than anyone else? If you and I are to boast, let those who boast boast in the Lord because He swallowed it up for all time. No more life, death, life, death. It's only life for the people of God. And that's what He says in verse 8 He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and He will remove the reproach of His people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And brothers and sisters, he is going to celebrate that day with the fruit of the vine. The fourth cup he will drink with us, the fruit of the vine. And you and I will celebrate that he's done it all for us. Jesus was a curse for us. Jesus was pierced through for us. And one day he's going to drink this cup with us. That's the great promise that you have in the word of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the great promises found in your word, that you're not a God who allows us to suffer and suffer endlessly, but you're a God that through Christ has swallowed up death for all time. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you took the curse of the sting of sin, death, and hell once and for all, and you paid it off so that we can have eternal life. I thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that you've given us these truths. You've not allowed us to just wander in the darkness, but you've given us objective truth through your word. I thank you, Lord, for all the answered prayer for our congregation. I thank you for the sustaining hand that you've put upon us. We're so grateful, and we continue to lift up those who are hurting. We ask, Lord, that you continue to remind them of these great promises. All by your spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear ones, this morning we have the privilege of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. I think it's very fitting that we do it on a day where we celebrate the cross of Christ and what he has done. Now, before I give you the words of institution, I just want to explain how we do the Lord's Supper here at Gospel of Grace. We have people right now that are going to hand out the elements. You're going to get a little cup and a little bread. And I will lead you in a minute. We're going to have a song. And I'll lead you through the words of institution. We'll take them together. Now, who's invited? Well, there's a warning in 1 Corinthians 11 that has to do with not rightly discerning the body of Christ. And what had happened at Corinth was originally you had very wealthy Christians who would recline in this triclinium, and they would exclude the poorer Christians in the atrium. 
and they wouldn't have fellowship with them. And Paul said, whatever supper you're having, it isn't the Lord's Supper. I'm paraphrasing. And so what we have to realize is that the Lord's Supper is for every believer in Jesus Christ. There is no distinction. There's no Jew or Gentile, nor no male, nor female, nor slave, nor free. All are one in Christ Jesus. And so if you're a believer in Jesus, you have a part in the table of God. And so with that, we'll listen to our song. I'll just give you the benediction here, and then I'll pray over our meal as well. Now may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads and just pray over the, pray over the food. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the meal that we're about to partake in. We knew all the blessings come from you. I thank you for those that had helped to serve this. And uh, we just praise you. We pray that everything we would do would be a blessing to your name. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.